A very, very good evening to you and a warm welcome along to this Power Hour. Power Hour is about applying God's Word in prayer. This is Gospel for Grampian. The theme for tonight is Testify. Testifying about God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy to each one of us and making what he did and especially his son Jesus Christ did on the cross very real to us. Now, this evening, we have a number of people who have testified. Some and two of these folks have already got podcasts out on the Internet on our podcast site. And one of the well, the second person we'll be hearing from, uh, as it were, is Ryan O'Hara. And the third is James Sutherland. But the first thing we're going to be doing is to actually play a video. Now this is a video about a soldier. I'm taking it as a very real, uh, true story. Uh, the video doesn't show how true it is, but for those of you watching on YouTube, you will be able to see this for yourself. So I trust that this is going to be a blessing to you. And I'll read it, uh, the subtitles as it were, for those listening on the radio as well. During an intense war in the battlefield, a young soldier was separated from his comrades while retreating. In defeat, the young soldier ran as fast as he could while the enemy troops gave chase. Alone and exhausted, the soldier knows that the enemy was close at hand. He spotted an old abandoned house and ran towards it. Quickly, he crawled into one of the dark rooms and hid. Feeling safe for a moment, he knows that once the enemy troops find the house, he would be captured and killed. Awaiting his doomed fate, he prayed to God. Lord, please protect me. My life is in your hands. May your will be done. I love you and I trust you. After his prayer, a spider began to weave a web at the entrance of the room. The spider laid delicate threads one by one across the room's doorway. The young soldier thought, I ask God for protection from guns and bullets, yet he sends a little spider to save me. Enemy troops discovered the house and began searching each room one after another. The young soldier could hear his enemy's footsteps moving closer toward his hideout. As the enemy troops reached the entrance of his room, they stopped and said, Nobody can be in that room. They would have had to break through the spider's web to enter. Let's keep moving. The enemy troops then backed away and searched elsewhere. In amazement, the young soldier fell to his knees and prayed. Lord, please forgive me, for I lack faith. Where there is God, when we face times of distress, do not forget that God works and protects in the most surprising ways. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Walk with God. Now this was a, a, a video that was forwarded to me on WhatsApp. And I trust that uh, for folks on YouTube, you will have been able to see that and read the text probably even better than me. But the point is, this is a story about how one man trusted in God enough to pray to him and seek. And God then answered that prayer in the most surprising of ways. 
Now, prayer, uh, I mean, testimony can be long, it can be short. It can even be a simple acknowledgement of God's goodness to each one of us. But these things are so necessary. We had a, a testimony, very short text testimony in from Pastor Heather Payton, who says, Father, I thank you today for filling my cup, cup until I want no more. In the name of Jesus, amen. Father, but for your mercy and for your grace, I'm alive today. For that, I am grateful, and I want to say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It may be as simple as that, as simple as giving God thanks for food on the table. That, too, is a testimony. Thanks for delivering from a potential accident. Well, we're going to be hearing about that in just a little while as we hear. We'll be hearing from James Sutherland a little bit later on. But first, uh, let's uh, go and read some scriptures surrounding the whole concept of uh, testimony. And testimony is mentioned in the Bible a good few times. Matthew 28, and it would be a good idea to read really through uh, from chapter 1 and to the end of the chapter. Early Sunday morning, as a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. The angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy as they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and stole his body away. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story is spread widely among the Jews and they still tell it today. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, you know what, listeners, I'm actually reminded that we should have actually even started off with a prayer. So let's actually do that before we actually uh, go on to the testimony of John the Baptist, which is taken uh, from John chapter 19. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, I just want to bring before you not only this program and myself, but all the words that are uh, uh, in front of me, and indeed the testimonies that we have coming up for people to hear. We pray, Lord God, that these testimonies, and indeed the scriptures from the Bible, and these prayers, Lord God, are going to be impactful and also encourage, inspire, inform, Lord God, 
and Lord God, that you will be in everything that is done. Amen. Right, uh, now, this is the Power Hour. It's about applying God's word in prayer, and uh, the subject is testifying, because testifying is about telling about the goodness and the good news of what uh, God has done through Jesus Christ, of what God has done in the world. Um, uh, and uh, that in biblical times, but also in more uh, up-to-date times as well, showing that God is still at work. Right, here's the testimony of John the Baptist. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, Who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well then, who are you? they asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the disciples who had been sent asked him, if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right have you to baptize? Jesus told them, I baptize with water, but right here in this crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though this ministry follows mine, his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave or to untie the straps of his sandals. This encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. Now the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am. For he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Uh, Now, this was John's testimony. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. And in John 5, verse 31, if I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. John 5, verse 32, but someone else is testifying about me. This is talking about Jesus. Um, And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. John 15, verse 26, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, He will come to you from the Father, and he will testify all about me. And John 15, verse 27, And you must also testify about me, because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Well, all that we can say is, as humans who have come over 2,000 years after that, we ourselves have not been with Jesus yet. Those of us who have accepted Christ as Lord and Saviour, have had experience of him. So what we can do is to testify to that. Uh, Right, coming up is a uh, testimony, and uh, this testimony is coming up from Ryan O'Hara. And I'll just uh, try and make sure we get his picture up uh, here for you, just so that you can see what he looks like. And uh, following on from that, we'll play his testimony out. Uh, The testimony you can actually hear on uh, our podcast site, uh, g4g.podbean.com. So here's the picture coming up for you just now. And uh, Ryan's testimony is uh, also coming up. You tuned into Gospel for Grampian, Gospel Community Radio for North Scotland, engaging, equipping, enabling communities to live life to the full with Christ Jesus at the centre. Hi, uh, so my name is Ryan O'Hara, and I'm just here to give a bit of testimony 
on my life so far, walking with Christ and uh, and the destiny or and the path He's planned it for my Lord. Um, so, when I was a child, I lived in Maastricht, Aberdeen, and uh, me, my mum, my dad, and later on my little brother. Had a lot of love in that family, never really wanted for anything, never was uh, um, struggling or anything with anything like that. Life was easy as a kid, as it is for most people, if they've, uh, they're living with a good family and that. So I was definitely blessed there. Um, went to school, did a lot of that, did okay in school and things like that, and went on holidays and things that any normal family would do. And basically grew up fun, loving life, and uh, just as a kid, you know. Went to school, uh, academy, things like that. Things were, were, things were okay in primary school. It's just trying to fit in with your friends uh, can, peer pressure, you know. Trying to fit in with a, uh, a group of friends is a big thing, Ken. And I tried to fit in, and I would do things to fit in, and only later on in life did I realise all this. But, this kind of led to drug taking when I got to academy. Started off with smoking and things like that. But uh, it got to the point where first year, second year, third year, fourth year became a period of escalation with drugs. Starting with just cannabis, working its way up to ecstasy and speed and things like that. And basically I left school with the plans to go to college to study motor mechanics <clears throat> and as I did um, I was also involved with another group of friends who were basically a close group to the group of friends I was already hanging around with but um, I ended up trying heroin and that's when things really took a turn for the worst my life became chaotic chaos started to rain in my life a lot more than it already did. Um, I mean, that be no fitting in and things like that. But my life just took a turn for the worst. I quickly amassed a habit with heroin. Quickly started to see the ugly side of what it was like to take heroin with people and how it changed them. With one person I can think of she was kind and nice to me in certain ways and then as we both got a habit next thing I knew she became unkind uh, selfish, greedy and well, thoughtless towards others as I did, as I became you see, when I started taking heroin I lost all the good qualities of my heart all the things that were there that were, were good suddenly get destroyed uh, and are replaced by heroin and your desire for it. Suddenly, my mum and dad, who I loved, I stole from. Um, I took everything I could for them, and I broke their heart, and I did that for a long, long time. And uh, as I grew, I tried different ways of escaping my habit. So I got to the age of 21, and started trying methadone and all that to come off of heroin. But it only replaced heroin uh, it never actually dealt with the problem on the inside what I came to find later on was that drugs really isn't the problem the problem is why you started taking drugs and if you can deal with that and get a look at that then you can start solving some problems start marking some ground and uh, towards a better life and towards a better freedom um, but unfortunately, for that time being, I never knew that. So I was kicked out of my mum and dad's, I'd say, 17, 18. And I uh, floated around different parts of Aberdeen, Torrey, uh, after prison as well, because I started having to feed my habit, and shoplifting became a regular thing, robbing and stealing. As I say, you lose all inhibitions and all good characteristics, anything that was in you before that was good judgment is suddenly gone. And uh, I quickly built up a criminal record, probation, and then that was not working after community service, so it was prison. 
remanded to prison in Craig Inches in Pullman Young Offenders Institute. And basically, that was just another level in the escalation of drugs in my life. It just kept going and building and building, to worse to worse to worse. Eventually, it takes to you, it takes its toll. But unfortunately, the addiction is still strong in you. No matter how bad it gets, you know, you really have to be tired, weary and sick of it. I remember being doing a show, probably the age of 21, 22, and a Teen Challenge bus being there for the girls who were working down the road. And uh, I was there with somebody just trying to cook up a, a plan just to make money. Um, but somebody had told me they had tasted freedom, had got enough drugs, had gotten clean through the Lord, Jesus. Of course, I thought, nah, let's see, let's see, I look at this, I want to see this, you know. Got on a bus and was served tea. But when I got on a bus, I believe this whole moment here was my burning bush. This was the, the, the moment. For Moses, it... I remember reading in Exodus 3, it was something that would catch his eye, it was something that was radical, it was out of this world, it was a bush burning and it wasn't consumed. That would take anybody's attention, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, for me, that needed to happen, it needed to be something radical, and that's what God is, extraordinary, out of this world, totally flips everything you believe in or know on its heed of the world and shows you how different it actually is. So when I stood in this bus and looked up at the back, I saw a couple of people who were in their right mind, made whole, totally brand new, and more. And uh, my attitude to go onto that bus and undo or try and undo what they were saying was totally just knocked on its head. I just was astounded by what I saw. And the closer I got, the more I felt this there's just presence surrounding him and it was just like uh, just just by looking at him I could see there was something different I knew there was something different in this moment and I was stopped in my tracks I asked the girl, I says so you did all this with God, no doctors nothing like that, God, this is how you got free and clean and as you are she simply just said yes again. and that was enough she didn't need to say any more, her character her attitude, her standing in front of me the way she was was enough for me to just be knocked back and I just remember thinking I want I want that, you know. Fortunately, uh, unfortunately, I'd left that bus that night but the seed was planted, you know, and uh, like Moses, I had to investigate, you know what I mean? Moses investigated that burning bush and that was when God talked to him. It wasn't until he made the choice that God said his name twice, you know, and that's where I think God's a gentleman. He actually, he want to force his cell into your heart. He will allow you to make the choice. He will show his cell to you, but you have to make the choice. That's free will. So later on, I remember a couple of years later, I was in a backwind, and I think it was Credo, the shop at the time, and I remember going in and asking a guy, because I knew it was a shop that sold Bibles, What's 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 all this with God and the devil and, and what happened? All this this war and everything. And the guy was stacking Bibles and he he looked at me and he had one Bible left in his hand. Without saying a word, he handed it to me after the question I'd asked him, I says, I haven't got any money. He says, No, I'll just take it, okay? So there I got my first Bible. Probably went to him, I read a few bits, didn't understand where to go, where to look. And it went in my drawer. Until later on, I was a couple about a year or two later, I was trying AA. And they were talking about a God. It wasn't a God as in Jesus, it was a God of their own understanding. But I remember thinking, if I want God, I want the real deal. I want what I saw in Teen Challenge. Probably. That's what I was would have been thinking. I can't remember or analyze every thought. But I do remember gone home and soon after just picking up that Bible out of the drawer and looking through it again and again. And I, I read for the beginning, you know, and the more and more I read, the more the, the words were just leaping off the page at me. And I kept reading, and then the next step was going to church, but asking God to come into my life and help me. And that's when God came into my life and started helping me. And I met Jesus back 
and that Teen Challenge bus when I saw him and those people. I then began to ask Jesus to come into my life and help me, and he did. But I hadn't realised yet that there's two ways, you know, you can meet Jesus, then there's following Jesus. Totally different. <laughs> there's totally two levels there. You know, meet Jesus, but now he says, come and follow me, Ken. You kind of follow Jesus and your own ways at the same time. It just doesn't work, you know. And you kind of do it all on your own strength. Unfortunately for me, I spent years trying to do it on my own strength. I tried Teen Challenge. I graduated it. Came out about a week after, two weeks, three weeks, four, a month. And I had a joinery job. I'd learnt joinery there and everything. And I just fell. I didn't again how to 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 ask God for help. I was still nay trusting him with my mess. So two years had passed and I was so ashamed of myself because I was free and clean and my mum, my dad and that were so proud of me and I'd broken their hearts again and I was so ashamed I couldn't face anybody. My daughter who I'd had when she, when I was 21 and now had grown up and I'd gotten to know I couldn't face um, but I was led to a church ACF through these two years uh, God sent a guy to my house to do an interview for NHS just a, a study and he saw my bible on the floor and he took me to ACF and he saw that I was struggling as well and fair there I started to get back up on my feet a couple of years ago and I started to walk again, going to church. Still struggling with addiction though, but God never left my side, no, not once. As I've asked God into my life, uh, I've always seen him in it, looking after me and directing my paths. Even when I wasn't listening, even when I was wanting to follow my own ways, he was always there to protect me. He is forever, he's truthful and you'll stay by your side no matter what. So, I was getting back to this point where I was on medication, not on meth, but on another drug called Suboxone, controlled yet again, but still, still you're still handcuffed, you're still locked. Uh, so I was heading back to Teen Challenge, coming off my meds, and the people at ACF were great. They really helped me. The couple who, who took me in the week before, and they really uh, provided a home for me in a safe place and I ended up going back at a Teen Challenge on a peaceful note uh, no smoking or anything like that so it made it a bit easier and I owe that to that couple in ACF Dave and Aileen Johnston and um, I kept going forth in Teen Challenge but I knew this time I had to learn I had to do it differently it had to be done differently and what your eye was taught in Teen Challenge is you can come here, you can do the programme, you can, but Teen Challenge won't save you. It's Jesus who saves you, you know. And uh, so I did it and I told my story to the centre manager about how I thought I messed up. And it was pressure. Pressure, you know, was something that I wasn't handling very well. And I'd never really learned to do it because when I was beginning to start life at 16, I stuck a needle in my arm. And boom, said no to life. So I'd never learned how to do life. But I liked my joinery skills and I was no longer a joiner there. So the centre manager put me to tasks and he gave me tips on how to do it. But he left me. So I had nobody looking on my shoulder. Pressure was on, you know. Every situation was like that. And I was so... Uh, I was just so beaten doing, telling God, you know, no. This is near where I'm meant to be. This is near the right place. Because uh, I was beating myself up. And God was just telling me, no, anything that I put in front of you that's a challenge, none of it can define you or your attitude. I'm the only one that defines you. So my faith was building, but the more I got out of my heart, the more I realised how I started taking drugs through peer pressure and the things I'm talking to you about, the mayor I realised, you know, I didn't need drugs, I just needed to get these things out and talk about them. And it's really a glory to Christ for bringing me to a place like that, uh, where I could do that, and sustaining me and giving me the strength to keep walking on, because before I went into Teen Challenge at that time, 
the second time. I was in a bad place uh, emotionally, looking at God and saying, you've made a mistake. I didn't wish that I was dead. I told him I wished I'd never been born. But that was me at the end of my strength. That was me coming to the end of my strength. That was me saying, Lord, I've got nothing left. And I believe God was letting me walk into this wall many times until I could come to that place and admit that I couldn't do it. That was him saying, give me the reins, I'll do the heavy lifting. Come on, let me take the lead. So, after a while um, in Teen Challenge, great place. Um, met a lot of brilliant guys there. A lot of my brothers who are out there in the world who are just doing their own thing but following Christ and uh, I love that, love knowing that. But me, myself, uh, getting to the end of my programme this time, I um, was coming to look for a job, somewhat in joinery skills and things like that. Uh, still unsure of myself a little bit, you know, um, but was ready to push on. Felt I'd made a lot of progress, talked about a lot of things that were locked up inside me. And uh, was looking to Jesus now to as my saviour and realising you can someone I can't do all this. I can't work a universe on my own on my own. I need to let God do his part and just trust in him and follow him, you know. And uh, that's what I did. And that's what I'm doing. It's nay easy, nay at all. I'm still learning that uh, every single day I'm gonna have to keep letting go of things and trust him just that bit more every single day and that's really hard really really hard but uh, I'm told by a lot of older Christians who I went to and asked you know does it get easier because they've been doing it a lot longer than me so I thought it would wise to ask them they, they, they said it does get easier and I'm encouraged by that Ken. but there's no way I could walk away and live a different life anyway uh, I've found my joy in Christ I found the growth of the last three months. I've been at Teen Challenge, been in the world. Uh, the growth I've managed to to do in that three months is is just I, I really can't explain how much I've grown, and it's all uh, due to God sticking with me and me asking Him for help when I'm in trouble, and you know Him coming in and helping me. He's always there. He's always walking before me. When I came out of Teen Challenge, I'd set up the job at Stuart Mill where I was working and I walked into that, but I still needed a place to stay. I needed a place with accountability and there's a couple at the church who who took me in and have provided a home for me and they just that, you know, a home ain't the roof or your head or a warm bed. It, they mark it nice, but the home is where people are sitting waiting for you to come home. If you come in and have a bad day, they're there to encourage you. And I've had a lot of bad days uh, due to my, my own thinking, you know. Um, but just learning to grow, just learning to walk and follow Christ in this world. Uh, but it's been really great. But these guys have been there for me coming home. They have encouraged me and they have just shown my love. Total love. And they've got my best interests at heart. And I can really see, again, love in action, you know. With these, with these people and uh, I'm so thankful for him and God truly does look after his children because where I am now I don't think I could have done it without those guys being there at my side and I'm so thankful for him um, but I'm looking to the future I'm hopeful I'm tearing down strongholds that are in my head and you know I'm really I'm going for it but to anybody that's out there that's struggling with addiction I would say, listen to this, and all I'm speaking here is the truth. That's all I'm speaking. Now, I heard a verse, and I've heard it before, um, but the thing is, it never became alive to me until now. And basically, what it is saying is, when we live by a Bible, when we walk by the Bible, the author of the Bible, Jesus, you know, God, when we listen to him, when we think of his words that he's put down on paper, he's left behind for us, and we live them with him as our teacher showing us how, I can only tell you that today I have broken chains. No, chains have been broken in me that I never, ever thought would have been. I mean, 
a year ago I told God he made a mistake and I wished I was never born and uh, I hurt him. But today I'm sitting here and I don't really have any use for drugs or alcohol in my life anymore. The cravings, the want, the hold has been broken, totally smashed to pieces. I am now standing in that place which I saw 10 years ago, two people on that Teen Challenge bus standing in. Uh, because I trusted in God. But this is, Jesus talks about, um, he's talking to the Jews who are listening to him. And he's telling him, look, if you hold my teaching, if you're really my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I could have picked for you a lot of verses, but recently this one's been on my mind. And no more true than it is, it is for me right now is the fact that I read the Bible out here in the world, not just in the safety bubble of Teen Challenge. I read it because I know I need it. I listen to it, I pray about it, I talk to God and ask him to give me wisdom and guidance because I know that it's the only thing that can see me through, you know. So our glory to Christ and yes, I live in freedom, you know. I just had to realise it and put aside my own strength, my own ways, or my own ways, and just trust in in Christ. And I've done that, and I'm still doing that, and I will do that till the end of my lifespan, but I cannot see myself walking any other way than following Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for him, and I love him. Amen. Yes, uh, I would just like to say a prayer right now for the people out there who are still suffering from addictions or even anybody who's suffering in any way in the heart or something just holding you down or breaking you down and keeping you bound up I would just like to say a prayer for those people and I'd just like to start so Father God I thank you first and foremost for my freedom every day in Christ the grace that I've received through him is my strength it's what I stand on and it's solid and I would like other people here in Aberdeen, out with Scotland and the world to know that Christ Jesus is in the business of healing hearts and setting people free. Um, and I just want to pray, Lord, that you would help those out there who are suffering, that this message would get to the right people and that they have ears to hear what you have to say, Lord, through my life and what you've done in it. And I just pray thanks for each and every person who can hear us. Uh, and thanks for the station that can send the message out, Lord. We all know that uh, you work through us and you can, amazing things can be accomplished, Lord. And I'm testimony of that, that I'm sitting here today free and clean. And I just pray that freedom for all those out there who are bogged down, who are chained up, who feel like they ain't got freedom. So Jesus, I pray in your name and ask these things in your name. Amen. And thanks very much to Ryan for O'Hara for giving us his testimony. And uh, it's a very uh, wonderful and fitting testimony. I hope it's encouraged uh, at least a good few folk who may well be listening to this, even as a podcast on YouTube uh, or indeed as our direct broadcast as well. Now, we're putting this out, and we're putting these testimonies out as well this evening because we would like to have and encourage more people to give their testimonies. And I know I can't do anything without actually, uh, say this, without actually doing this myself. So I'm going to go and put myself on the line a little bit later on uh, in the show and uh, just tell you something about my testimony and hopefully this might also uh, resonate with some people as well. Well, the next person that we're going to be uh, catching up with is uh, a person who's already been podcast, who's already uh, gone out very recently, and that's uh, James Sutherland. Um, you can listen just to his testimony if you wish to. Uh, that's also available, but on this program too. Now, you'll be able to hear this program going out tomorrow evening, that's Saturday evening, from 9pm onwards. 
Here's uh, James Sutherland's uh, testimony coming up for you. And the picture just up. Well, I was born in 1934 in the village of Cairnbog in the northeast of Scotland. I was the youngest of four children, four children, two brothers and a sister. My father came in and he came down for the Highlands as a boy, as a boy for Rosshire. My mother, Maggie, she was for the village of Gardenston, otherwise Gamery. She was brought up in a close brethren meeting. In the village of Cairnbog, I have awful happy memories, playing down the shore on the rocks and on the water. And at night times, in the darkness time of the war, we played in the streets in total darkness. I was brought up in a Nafa strict Christian home, and we attended the Assemblies of God meeting, which was a new church in the village. Tom Beckett was a pastor at the time, and it was under his influence, along with Alagdathe, the superintendent of the Sunday school, that I gave my life to the Lord. I still remember as a 11-year-old boy kneeling down in the hall and giving my life over to the Lord. There was other five young lads in the village that gave their life to the Lord at the same time. John Strachan, Andra Carner, two John Tates and myself, and we became known as Beckett's Boys. The pastor and his wife, Margaret, had no family of their own, but they did a good job of encouraging us and looking after us spiritually. All five are still alive and going on with the Lord. We were taught well in the Word, a point that has proved as two of the boys became pastors. I still remember at the Sunday school, the first verse that I learned in the Bible was John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. James, tell me about the incident that happened in your life when you were 13 years old. Well, the Lord really confirmed his heart in my life in a real way around two years after becoming a Christian. When I was 13, I was known for climbing anything possible around the village. One day, while climbing an electric pole, at about eight metres off the ground, I put my hand on a live wire. I was electrocuted and the pain was running through me was too much. So I passed out and fell to the ground. It took me days to fully come round, and the doctor said at the time that he should have been writing out my death certificate. I really should have been dead. But the Lord had other plans. The pastor got the church to pray and put telegrams all over the churches in Britain asking them to pray for me. I've often wondered in the back of my mind why. Why did the Lord spare me? But I've always been thankful that he did. Well, my faith had grown as a young teenager and I started to sing in the church. And at convention meetings around the northeast along with Violet Carnot and Barry Noble. Songs that stand out from these days were Back of the Clouds, The Sun is Always Shining and Stay Still in the Hand of the Potter. From the age of 13, I led choruses, which you would call in those days the worship now and did so for many years. At 15, I left the school and served my time as a board builder with Tommy Summers down at the breakwater in Fraserburgh. I left to do my national service, which was compulsory at the time, down in England. During my time serving at Wheatley, near Oxford, I went to the Elam Church and sung there nearly every week, and they made me very welcome in the church there. James, was it hard being a Christian doing your national service during England? It was hard being a Christian doing your national service, but I decided the first night that I would nail my colours to the mast. So I nailed down in prayer, expecting to get a boot thrown at me at any time, but I had no problems at all. I was blessed to meet other Christians and made good friends with them during my time there. Romans 1 and 16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Well, at 23, I came back to Fraserburgh and started the fishing. I met my wife, Mary, not long after, and we got married in 1961 in a deep-sea mission, 
where we fellowshiped for years under the leadership of two godly women, Miss Wood and Miss Watson. I continued to sing in the services, but never spoke or testified. I just didn't have the confidence for that. In 1970, with Maury's mother and father and our two boys at the time, Andrew and Graham, we moved to South Africa. The business ventures we had gone and pursued didn't work out, and I always felt that at that time I was out of the Lord's will. But recently was reminded of how God's ways are greater than our ways. A South African couple who we became friendly with and who stayed next door to Maury's parents came to know the Lord and now all their family are believers in the Lord. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. Okay, James, South Africa didn't quite work out um, as planned, so what happened in your life after that? When we came back to Scotland in 1971, and in 1974 we started a business, initially selling winkles from our garage, and called it Whiteling Seafoods. God blessed us over the years, and we have learned to trust in him through the highs and lows, good times and bad times. We are five of a family, three boys and two girls, and many grandchildren. We have learned always to turn to God, to pray, to ask for his help. The Lord is faithful, and if we honour him, he honours us. James, there was an incident that happened in your life two years ago that really had a big impact on you. Tell me about that. On the 16th of April, 2007, I had a bad accident, which changed my whole life. I was cutting grass we a tractor mower. I was turning near a wall. I had to jump off to clear an obstacle that was lying in the grass. As I jumped off, my sleeve catched the gears and knocked it into gear. With the engines at full throttle and the blades running, I was dragged along the grass. The mower eventually hit a tree and went over the top of me. I was being dragged underneath and felt the blades cut my side and the weight crushing my chest. The blades came to a halt as my belt and my side jumped them which allowed me to breathe a bit more easily. I'm not sure how long I was under there, but that kind of weight on top of you, five minutes seems like an eternity. I began to cry out for help, shouting the best I could. I remember shouting, Jesus, please help me. Send someone to help me. I was desperate and could relate to that verse in Psalm 120. I cried to the Lord in my deep distress and he heard me. At that moment, my daughter Valerie arrived at the house. She had come to collect her daughter, who was in the house with Mary, and had come an hour earlier than planned. Praise God. Valerie quickly called for help, and emergency services came quickly. A team of firemen, along with some of my family, lifted the moor off. The doctor ordered the helicopter to come, and it arrived within 15 minutes. At that point, I don't remember much. I was going in and out of consciousness. But according to the medical staff... The doctor had given a very small chance of me arriving in Aberdeen alive. So they, they didn't think you were going to be alive when you arrived in Aberdeen. Tell me about it. Well, they didn't think that, that I would be alive when I arrived at Aberdeen, but my injuries was a lot worse than what I anticipated. I had a fracture in both of my pelvis bones. I had a ruptured liver, a ruptured bowel, a big hole in my side where the blades had been in, and my elbow, which is bone. At this time, I would like to thank the emergency services, the hospital staff, prayers and visits and encouragement from family and friends and the church. Thank you. Well, I'm so thankful above all to the Lord for his protection, provision and purpose for my life. I still wonder why he spared me again, but know that he has given me so many opportunities to share my testimony and sing. More in the last two years since my accident than in many years before. I have been blessed also to be on mission with Ken Etchkinson in Poland, Ken preaching and myself singing and giving testimony, and I have been thrilled to see many people coming to the Lord. I want to give all the glory to him. Galatians six fourteen says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Looking back on my life, I'm very thankful for everything the Lord has done, for my family and the life he has given. My hope and prayer is that anyone who finds himself in crisis and in need of help, that they would turn to the Lord, the only one who can rescue you in your time of great need. 
I just like to say that I love the Lord with all my heart and would encourage anyone listening that Christ is the answer. Thanks very much to James Sutherland for giving us that CD with his testimony and he can actually hear that um, along with one of the songs that he sung uh, on one of the other videos on YouTube and he'll be able to hear uh, it's in the full version, at least, um, later on in the year when we go and have a special day uh, in Fraserburgh, uh, a day in the brook, one might call it. Right, I have to be honest now, listeners, it's uh, time now. I can't just put other people's testimonies on and not give a testimony myself. So here goes. I was born in southwest of England. My dad was born in Plymouth, and my ancestors were Cornish tin miners. Mum and Dad did the best for us possible. Uh, Dad was a solicitor, but things weren't always easy for him. But they did the best for us, both for my brother and myself, and whatever they did for one, they did for the other. We both got sent to a boarding school, and I confess I wasn't really the most sporty individual, and I was somewhat insular so it didn't really suit me that well. I didn't do particularly well. And it was only when I turned to God and actually asked him to help and told him honestly that I was bottom of the class, told him honestly that I really wasn't much cop at anything, that he helped me. And my performance at school and then at college and at University really uh, came on. Now, I've not been the best of students, not been the most organised of students, but from someone who didn't have a, any chance of going away to university or getting a degree or even getting a job, well, God has come through for me and he's given me that. For someone who didn't have any chance of a girlfriend, let alone a wife. God has come through for me. And one of the things that I was asking God about, when's this going to happen? Just as I have been recently with regard to the vision that God has given to me. But time and again, God says, I want you to put me first. And when I did, certainly in the case of Helen and also before, God came through in a most wonderful way. And I have to say that God has given me the most wonderful wife. Uh, It is, I cannot just thank him enough. And I cannot thank Helen's mum and dad enough for the daughter that they have given. I know she's going to be embarrassed, but I have to just say it. Thank God for Helen. She is everything. In fact, (laughs) I even wrote down a list of the things that I would want a wife to have. Maybe that's a tip for guys. But you have to put God first. God has not missed anything out. Now with regard to the station, to the vision, at first the vision was somewhat woolly and it took me a little time, at least until 2010, We started off in 2006, by the way, in the top bedroom of our house. And it took me until 2010 to turn to the Lord and ask him, is this really where I'm meant to be? What am I meant to do? And God had already, I remember, told me that he would make the vision much bigger than ever I could imagine. And it's certainly a God-sized vision. And I'm now waiting on him to fulfill it. But I know that my strength comes from God. I know that when I have difficulties and in everyday life, I need to be looking to God to help me because I cannot rely on anyone else. People disappoint and they frequently do. I make a mess of things and I need God to get me out of it. But providing I acknowledge the Lord for everything that he's done for me 
asking him to help me when things get difficult, when I get tempted, when difficult situations come along. God has been there for me. I look back and I see how he has been there. He has lifted us out and when we have given, we've never run out of things because God has been there for us. So I want to thank God. This has been a very short testimony. But I can testify definitely to God's goodness that he is a true, living and loving God. And that if you actually seek God and say, Lord, help me because I'm finding reading the Bible difficult, because I'm finding seeking you difficult, because I'm finding this difficult. Being honest, and God will come through for you. He has come through for me, and he keeps on coming through. And I want to testify to that. He is my saviour, my Lord, my provider, helper, counsellor, everything. Everything that the Bible says he is. God is. This is the Power Hour, and we've been thinking about the subject of testify. I hope that you will agree that we have done that and that you will be encouraged by what you have heard. We're going to be going out with a wonderful uh, song um, and the wonderful song is God's Wonderful People. It's from Piano Praise uh, by Matthew, uh, by Andrew Paulson. So thank you very much for listening and you'll be able to hear uh, this program again tomorrow evening on Gospel for Grampian. And that's g4g.org.uk forward slash WP forward slash listen. And that's after nine o'clock tomorrow and also during the week as well. You'll also be able to hear the podcast without the music that's up and coming. But for the moment, uh, I'm going to bid you bye-bye for the moment. <laughs>